Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. Hope you all are doing well. Today we're going to talk about leaderless replication. Last week, I uploaded a video where we talked about leader follower architecture. I would recommend checking that out before uh, coming back and watching this video. So in this video, at first, we're going to talk about how leaderless replication is different from leader follower. And then we're going to talk about how our write works in this architecture also how our read works and finally we're gonna take a look at a few algorithms that are only used in this leaderless architecture so let's start with talking about how is the leaderless replication different from the leader follower model so the first thing is in the leaderless architecture no one node serves all the write requests if you remember from the leader follower architecture, there was one node which served all the writes, and then you had all the replica nodes which were responsible for all the reads. Unlike that architecture, in the leaderless model, all the nodes are considered to be peer nodes, so all of them accept read and writes. You don't have dedicated nodes that only serve either read or write. There is no single point of failure in a leaderless architecture. If you recall from the leader follower model, you had all your writes going to the leader node. So if there were if there was something bad that happened to the leader node, then you would have to elect a new leader and then you have a period of time where the writes are not being successful. However, in the leaderless architecture, given all the nodes are peer nodes, even if one or two of the nodes are down, you can, you can still keep writing data to your database. The leaderless architecture is a decentralized design. As mentioned before, there is no one single point of failure. So the system is more robust and can handle node failures much, much better than a leader follower architecture. You get much better availability with this leaderless model. That's because of the reason I mentioned before. One or two nodes can go down and the system is still going to be working as expected. Whereas in a leader follower model, if some of the more crucial nodes went down, you would have a period of time where the writes and reads are not being served correctly. Lastly, it's, the, it's more, more common to see this architecture employed in non-relational databases as opposed to relational databases. Relational databases like Postgres and MySQL are more used to having the leader follower model that we talked about last week. But non-relational databases like DynamoDB or Cassandra are more likely to use this leaderless replication. All right, so now let's see how does a write work in a database that uses a leaderless architecture. So whenever a user wants to write some data, you have the write client. This can be whatever your database is. You should have a client in almost all programming languages that you can use to directly talk to the database from your backend application. So when you're trying to write some new data to a database, the write client is going to send that data to all the nodes that your database has, right? So let's say your database has three nodes. In this, we have node one, node two, node three. That means all your data are replicated in three separate database machines. Whenever you're writing a new piece of data, the client is going to send the data to all of the nodes. If you compare this with the other model, where the write was only going to the leader node and then the replication to the other nodes was happening asynchronously. But in this case, whenever you want to write the new piece of data, the client is going to send the data to all the nodes. In this case, we have three. But even though the client is sending the write to all three of the nodes, it's only going to wait for two of the nodes to come back with an acknowledgement that tells the client that the data has been written successfully. So in this example, we have three nodes, but the write client is only waiting for two acknowledgement before considering the write to be a success. This number is uh, tunable. 
So you can, instead of waiting for two acknowledgement, you can wait for one acknowledgement. But of course, there is some trade-off you make when it comes to availability and consistency. And we're gonna talk about that more in details in a bit. But on a very high level, you have three nodes with all your data. Your right client sends the data to all three of the nodes and then waits to hear back from two of the nodes before considering the right to be a success. If you want this application to be even faster when it comes to writes, you can wait for one acknowledgement instead of two, but then again, you run into that trade-off that I talked about and we're gonna talk about it more in, in like a few minutes. All right, so that's how a write works. To compare it with the leader uh, follower model, in this one, every write is going to all the nodes, whereas, uh, whereas in, the, uh, in the leader follower model, the write was going to the leader node only. So to talk about the steps once again, the client sends the new data to more than one node. So if you have three nodes, the data will be sent to all three of the nodes. And then the client waits for acknowledgements from X nodes. In, a, in the case you see over here, we're waiting for an acknowledgement for two nodes, but this is configurable. You could even make it as so you wait to hear from all three of the nodes. But of course, that's going to make the app, uh, make the database much slower when processing writes. Yeah, so X is configurable. Depending on your use case, you can go from one up to three in our example. When the client gets all the acknowledgements, the write is successful and the client can move on to other writes. So in this case, the client has to wait for node one and node two to acknowledge that they received the new data before it can call it a success and move on. A key point to note is that all nodes don't need to acknowledge for a write to be successful. You get to define how many acknowledgements you want to wait for until you call the write a success. All right, so that is how our write works in our leaderless architecture. Now let's talk about how our read is going to work. If you recall in the leader follower model, the every read request was going to one replica and the data was being read from that one replica, right? You didn't have, uh, you did not have all the replica sending the data or anything like that. You were only reading the data from one replica and giving it back to the user. However, in a leaderless architecture, reads work a bit differently. So the read client, wh whenever you execute a query, the read client is going to ask for that data that you need from all the nodes. So you have node one, node two, and node three. The read client is going to ask the data from all the nodes. And then amongst node one, two, and three, one or more of the node might have old data that, that wasn't updated, right? We're going to talk about why that happens in a bit, but in a leaderless architecture, it's common for one or two nodes to have stale data. So the read client gets the data from all three of the nodes, and then it has some logic that it can use to determine amongst the three copies of data that it received, which is the most recent data. It, uh, it resolves that conflict and then sends the most recent data back to the user. So let's talk about the steps once again in a more granular detail. So the first step is the client tries to read data from X nodes. So of course, in our case, we're reading data from all three of the nodes that we have. But once again, this number is configurable. So instead of reading from all three, you can read from one or two. Or if you had more than three nodes, you could read from more nodes. This number is configurable and of course there's a trade-off. You can read from less number of nodes, but then you're more likely to get stale data because out of all the nodes due to network errors, it is common that some of your nodes might have older data. All right, so the client tries to read data from X nodes. In our case, it's gonna be all three of the node. And then the client resolve, resolves the conflicting data using some meta, metadata. When I say conflicting data, what I mean is some of the nodes might have stale data 
and the client needs a way to figure out which is the stale data and which is the most recent data and then send only the most recent data back to the user. Now the question might be, how does the client know which data is old and which data is more recent? There are multiple different ways of doing it, but two of the more common approaches that a databases take is one is that every piece of data has some kind of an ID or a version number associated with it. So when the client is getting the same data from different nodes, it can compare the version number or ID and then pick the one that is the most recent. The other one is a timestamp. So every write can have a timestamp associated with it. And the read client can, uh, can like look at all the three pieces of data that it received from the three different nodes and then only pick the data with the most recent timestamp because that can guarantee you that the most, uh, the, the, the most recent timestamp is the most updated data. Once the client has figured out which is the most recent data, it can go ahead and send that piece of data to the user because now it knows that it is the most recent data. All right, so that is how our read happens. But when you look at both the read and write pattern, you can see that in a leaderless architecture, you need to somehow figure out what nodes have old data and what nodes have the most recent data. So it's very common for different nodes to have stale data due to network errors. And we need a way to kind of go and... <laughs> All right, so you need a way to somehow figure out a way not only to find the stale data, but also go ahead and update the data in the nodes that actually have the stale data. So there are two ways that you can uh, go ahead and refresh the data in the stale nodes. One is called a read repair and the other one is more of a background process. So let's talk about both of those. The, fir the first one is gonna be read repair. So in our read repair, uh, you can call it an algorithm or a technique. During the read request, the client knows which nodes have stale data. The client figures out what's the latest data. And then the client can go ahead and write the latest data to the stale nodes, right? So this is gonna be not state, but stale. All right, so what I mean is, let's say in this example, the read client gets the data from node one, two, and three, and then it compares either the timestamp or the version number and figures out that node two has old data. Now that it knows that node two has the old data, and it also knows what is the most up-to-date data, it can go ahead and write that up-to-date data to node two so that node two does not have stale data anymore, right? So that is essentially what read repair is. So at read time, the client figures out which node has old data and then sends the new data to that node to refresh it. All right, the other process is more of a background process. So this can be a background job that's running in your database cluster. The job of the background process is to look at the data differences between the different nodes, figure out which nodes have stale data, and go ahead and update those nodes with the most recent data. Okay, this whole process is done asynchronously, so you don't have you don't do the whole thing at the read request time like you do for the read repair approach. All right, so now that we kind of have an idea about how both the write and read works, let's talk about the biggest trade-off you make when you choose a database that employs a leaderless a replication architecture. So more often than not, these databases tend to be more available. That's because as you saw, your data lives in all the nodes and you can write new data to any of the nodes. That means that 
whenever a few of the nodes are down, you don't have to worry about the system breaking because you will always have another node up and running to accept your read or write request. Okay, that's why the these databases tend to be more available. Now, on the flip side, they also tend to be less consistent. That's because, as you saw, saw before, it is common for these databases to have nodes that are to have nodes that don't have the most up-to-date data. We talked about the two processes that ensures that the data is updated as much as possible, but it is natural for some nodes to, to not have the most recent data, uh, thereby making them less consistent. So the trade-off you're making is you're choosing a database that has more availability, but it will have less consistency. Uh, the consistency is a, uh, is uh, configurable, so you have different knobs that you can tune when configuring your database that is going to make it more consistent. But the more consistent you make your database, you're doing so at the expense of availability. Okay, so that's sort of like a spectrum that you're in. You can make it more configurable, but at that time it's going to be less available. So you want to choose a nice middle ground and that totally depends on the kind of application that you have. All right. And then a typical use case of these kind of applications, uh, sorry, these kind of databases uh, is a write, in, a write intensive application where availability is more important than consistency. So you are more likely to pick such databases when your application has a greater need for availability than very strong consistency. And to wrap it up, two very common databases that use this uh, leaderless replication is Cassandra and DynamoDB. Both are non-relational databases. Both are used more often than not in very high write intensive application where you're okay sacrificing some of the read consistency. All right, so that was all about leaderless replication. I am gonna leave some references in the description below, and I'm also gonna leave the note that I went through in this video as a PDF so that you can refer to it later on. So hopefully that was helpful. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the comments below and I'm gonna try to get to them as soon as I can. With that being said, I hope you guys have a good rest of the day and I'll catch you in the next one. Bye-bye.